Okay, thank you for that um, um, introduction. Uh, we were just trying to give people um, time to get in um, before we start, but um, we're now six minutes in, so and we like to stay prompt and on time. So we'll get started. So hello, I am Dr. Head, uh, Headley. I'm your <laughs> moderator and one of the co-founders of Popolic, and we are super excited to welcome you to our first live discussion today. Um, just a little bit about Popolic. Um, we are a platform for open and evidence-based discussions on public health issues affecting local and global communities, and we provide substantiated information and practical approaches to address public health issues. Um, our vision is to raise awareness on local and global public health issues in order to promote um, healthy quality of life and environment in order to mitigate social and public health injustices. Uh, so stay abreast um, with um, public health uh, information and current issues, and you can also register with us on um, www.pubholic.org. Um, that picture right there, uh, our model is modeling some T-shirts. So we'd like to give it, show an appreci our appreciation, give a shout out to um, Ms. Owens, uh, for her company, the um, Connections, um, they are the ones that have started um, working with us to implement T-shirts uh, for the future. Um, okay, next slide, please. Okay, so um, before I introduce our wonderful speaker today, I want to give um, an overview of what we'll be discussing. Um, we will be discussing the travel process and restrictions um, to Nigeria, um, COVID-19 preventative measures um, as you land in Nigeria and move through the environment, um, some population observations and perceptions that were um, brought about based on um, our speaker's experience, and also we will talk about, of course, our COVID-19 caseload in Niger Nigeria and how it compares to um, U.S. And then we will um, open the floor for open discussion for all of you guys to participate and ask your questions and also collaborate and contribute with us. So um, now I'll get into introducing our, our wonderful guest speaker today. Um, we have, um, he is also a co-founder of Pubholic with myself. Um, his name is Dr. Amalu. He is an expert in applied public health epidemiology and has many years of experience in the biotechnology industry. Um, he is also an epidemiologist with the State of California Public Health Department. He, had, he is a subject matter expert in program implementation and evaluation, epidemiology research design, research methods, and statistical analysis. And he he is well known for providing high level dissertation services um, on social science and public health to PhD students across the US and around the world. Dr. Amalu has published several articles and has been acknowledged in several dissertations. He is currently writing a book in biostatistics bio epidemiology. I now turn the floor over to you, Dr. Amalu. Thank you so much, uh, you know, Dr. Headley, for uh, hosting this uh, important discussion. And uh, it's my pleasure, um, in my humble opinion, to have the opportunity to have this amazing audience here. A lot of experts is uh, included in this discussion. So uh, the reason is that I wanted to share my observation uh, uh, during my trip to Nigeria. And the basic uh, essence of being a scientist is to have the ability to observe. And then through observation, we can actually uh, come up with some theories and maybe perhaps a uh, solution to mitigate the current uh, epidemic or pandemic that's going on uh, with COVID-19. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yes, awesome. So let's get started. Um, um, can you start us off by, let's just talk about your pre-travel experience and, and the process. Yes, so uh, before I traveled to Nigeria, uh, I, of course, obviously, uh, booked my flight ticket. Uh, during the process, 
uh, the airline had informed me that uh, Nigeria has put some restrictions in terms of traveling to Nigeria. And the two key restrictions is that one, uh, you have to be able to have a COVID test five days or 120 uh, hours prior to leaving your uh, your point of origin. And the second thing they require is that you will also uh, go online through a specific uh, uh, QR code they provide to you to actually uh, register in any lab in Nigeria. Once you land in Nigeria, then you will be able to also have another test, which they call retest. For this retest, you must have it or you should have it uh, seven days uh, after you landed in Nigeria. Okay, so uh, that's the process I took. So here in the U.S., since I'm living from the United States, I went ahead uh, five days prior to my travel. I made an appointment test for COVID-19. Fortunately, I was negative. And then I also went online and I was able to get authorization or clearance to get a, an appointment test or retest in Nigeria. So those are the two documents I took uh, before I boarded my plane and I was cleared to travel. Okay, that's very nice. That's very good. So there, so we're saying that there is a such thing as a travel COVID-19 test or um, no, because that hasn't been publicly broadcasted. And I know that now what's going around, um, different videos are being presented that, you know, for international travel, um, we are, you know, certain airlines are now implementing um, COVID-19 um, testing, requir you know, requirements prior to travel. So um, I would expect to see new policies or, you know, being able to call and say, hey, I'm traveling internationally. There are, you know, um, I need a COVID test for travel. Yeah, let me make it clear. It, it's not actually the airlines that are in, uh, uh, requiring this. Wherever you're traveling, the country where you're traveling are the one that puts the uh, restriction in place. The airlines are there to enforce that. So wherever you're traveling, they have to look at, they already know the requirements of each country. In this case, Nigeria required this, uh, these restrictions. So uh, you have to show them those documents uh, and show them your passport, where you're going. They already know where you're going. Based on that, they have to clear you. Maybe there's other countries that doesn't require those restrictions. Now, when you travel uh, traveling to those countries, you know, you don't have to have a COVID test. But uh, specifically, we are talking about Nigeria here, and I'm sharing specific uh, restrictions Nigeria had put in place. Okay, thank you for that. So let's move on. Um, we've gone through the travel process, um, you know, changing planes or, you know, connection flights. Now you've landed in Nigeria. Um, let's talk about uh, the environment as far as COVID-19 um, is and any type of observation that occurred while you were there. So prior before I left Nigeria, you know, uh, I've worked, uh, again, I'm not speaking for a State Department in this regard, but I'm just sharing basic information. I've worked with a California COVID-19 team, uh, and uh, one of the things we, we're really enforcing here in the United States is one, social distancing, two, uh, uh, sanitizing a lot, and three, uh, wearing masks. Those are just common basic things, right? So when I landed in Nigeria, uh, the airport still maintained those social distancing. They want, the uh, custom wants you to wear masks, they maintain those. You know, I showed them my uh, clearance for the test I had in, in the United States. They cleared me. They also required that uh, retest uh, confirmation. I showed them the uh, retest. And now the retest, you have option to uh, pay it at the time you book that retest or pay it uh, 
you know, when you go to the lab. So I, I selected the letter. So I paid uh, seven days after. Now, uh, once I was clear to get in the city, that's where the whole dilemma starts, right? Because now I'm out of the airport, driving down through the streets of Abuja, which is the capital uh, the airport that I came through. Uh, I was shocked. I was really surprised. Uh, no one in Nigeria, many people in Nigeria were wearing adhering at all uh, with uh, mask wearing or even social distancing. So, you know, usually in the morning I, I'll get up and, and run around uh, the neighborhood. I see the same thing. You know, there's nothing like very few people I have to say are wearing masks. However, there's few exceptions. Now, if there are some restaurants that I will go to, you know, they require you to sanitize, they give you sanitizer, and they require you to wear masks before you get into the uh, restaurant. That's some. Now, there's also government uh, uh, offices where you will go. Those require you to wear masks, and they try as much as possible to maintain social distancing, but that's not very efficient. Uh, those are very, very few. And some maybe, you know, phone companies, you know, if you want to go get phone, you, you go to the office, they require you to as well wear masks. And also another area that requires you to wear masks before you get in their building is the bank. However, there's very interesting thing that happened. This is uh, one of the banks that uh, we went to. I was here with my sister and uh, most of my family and my sister was trying to get into the bank, right? Here are the crowd sitting in front of the bank. Most of this crowd uh, are not actually wearing masks. I can only count two people that are wearing masks here. The security guy standing in front of the gate of the, uh, of the bank and this guy walking right here. Majority of them, no social distance, and this is one section but when you go across the bank in Nigeria, this is what you see. You see this type of crowd and you see uh, non-adherence to uh, mask wearing. Okay, now if you go, uh, let me say something. When I was in Nigeria was the week Nigeria had social unrest. And uh, I was, uh, we were in the middle of it. You know, we were driving from Abuja back to Enugu Enugu is one of the states in the uh, in Nigeria. So uh, we see a lot of crowd on the street. Tires are burning in, in, in front of the road and cars are being re uh, redirected. Many people that you see on the street during this protest are not also wearing masks. Of course, again, that's a protest, but in normal situation, it just mimic normal uh, lifestyle uh, or condition and how many Nigerians view COVID-19. They, they're not scared. They're not panicking about this. Uh, they're not even traumatized. I was traumatized because uh, I have been conditioned here moving from the United States to visit Nigeria. This is the uh, way to actually prevent yourself from getting infected. So for one week, I was still maintaining kind of uh, U.S. Uh, rules in Nigeria. And uh, I have to say... <laughs> Uh, okay, so this one right here is, uh, I don't know if you're going to play it, but this is uh, happening in Oka. Uh, these are a uh, uh, crowd from the protest that actually attack one of the uh, 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 vehicles that are transporting some uh, food produce that uh, Anambra State government has hid for a while and they kind of stopped, uh, stopped this vehicle and started looting the vehicle. And many of this crowd were, um, <laughs> they, there's no mask. They, they didn't wear masks. So um, I have to say it was very, very uh, traumatizing for me to see because I was actually scared that, you know, by the time my trip is done, I will, there's no doubt I will be infected with COVID-19. Now, Nigeria is a crowd-based community. They like crowd. They like, they don't really, you know, people are on your face, you know, uh, all the time. So what uh, if, when I went to uh, several uh, open markets, uh, anybody that comes from, uh,
came from Africa will understand what open market is. It's like flea market, yeah, you know, it's, it's popular. You know, everywhere you go, people in open market do not wear masks. Many people I ran into, I, I went to several open markets in different locations, in on the market, you know, Enugu market, you know, Oka market, several areas, and there's nothing like maintaining social distancing in those crowds, and there's nothing like uh, uh, in majority wearing masks. So, you know, that, those are my observations. Uh, this observation I just described has very important meaning because now the what we're going to look at later on down through this discussion is looking at the case load in Nigeria to, you know, trying to decipher what is going on in Nigeria. And this is not just happening in Nigeria. A client of mine also traveled to Cameroon this same month I travel. And when she came back and I was talking to her about this, my experience, she shared the same experience, that they were laughing at her for wearing masks and trying to maintain social distancing. And they were actually telling her there's nothing like COVID-19. And for some of my documentary, uh, I have interviewed a lot of people. They believe that COVID-19 probably is real, the virus itself, but there's nothing like COVID-19 like they're reporting in Nigeria, across a very different state I've driven through. I did the same interview, and this this is their perception. Now, you know, the reason why they believe that, I don't know, and that's not the purpose of this discussion. Right. So I imagine anyone traveling from, um, especially the U.S., uh, a place that you know, is really big on six feet distancing, uh, even in the stores and, and so forth. I mean, you know, you go in a grocery store, they say, enter this aisle this way, exit this way even, uh, and some grocery stores um, here on the East Coast uh, where I'm located. But um, I, I can imagine that there would be a sense of insecurity and anxiety uh, going to um, a country like Nigeria. But, um, you know, it's neither here nor there, but there must be something or, or some information being passed to the people, this population, that they feel secure enough that they don't have to wear masks. Um, I'm only making an assumption based on this discussion, um, but there must be something for them to, to feel free, you know, something that we don't, we don't have that security here. So um, moving along, notating, um, you know this. I wonder what the Nigerian caseload is um, for COVID-19, and how does that compare to the um, United States of America? Can you uh, give us some insight to that? Yes, uh, and that's a very good, uh, uh, you know, lead to this right now um, from everything I've discussed. So we know now that the country Nigeria has a strict uh, a regulation in traveling from any other country, Europe, any other African country, they have that. That's, you know, that's perfect, you know, in, in terms of public health and epidemiology, that's really good. Now, once you get inside the country itself, you know, that's nothing like, uh, in terms of the population base, they're not maintaining those social distancing or wearing masks. Now, that being said, so when, again, these numbers you're seeing here continues to change. So, uh, and also my observation is not research. So I don't want people to think that I went to Nigeria to conduct a research, uh, uh, or, you know, <laughs> ask people to participate. No, that's not the case. It was strictly observation. Like anybody can be walking on any street and making their observation. So, uh, don't hold me for informed consent and all that uh, scientific, uh, you know, uh, nine yards. This is observation. Now, the numbers I, I put in here is the numbers reported to the World Health Organization, and the rest of the world can see this number. Nigeria currently has over uh, 70,000 cases, right? And Nigerian case load is uh, 61 million. The current Nigerian recovery percent reported is 94%. So among those that has been infected with COVID-19. Now, if you compare this to, of course, global, it's over 68 million. 
uh, global death cases is 200 per 1 million or 20 per 100,000. And then when you look at the current global recovery percent is 71%, way lower than Nigeria. Um, the U.S. case load here is now over 15 million. U.S. death cases is 884 per 1 million or 88 per 100,000. And the current U.S. recovery percent is 59%. So we know that uh, U.S. has a strict uh, and standardized public health intervention, epidemiologists all over the whole place. I'm not saying that Nigeria doesn't have sound scientists. They do, you know, there's uh, well-informed uh, uh, scientists across Nigeria and from one state to the other. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. But there's something else I needed to share. Uh, this is uh, Nigerian pre preparedness for health uh, risk. And this was published by a World Health Organization, I uh, believe in 2017. So they published this based on three metrics, prevention, detection, and response. So when they look at Nigeria in terms of preventing capacity, Nigeria in fact had a scored 1.9, which is a low limited capacity, correct? So now if you look at detection, Nigeria scored 2.6, uh, which is below the de developed capacity. And then when you look at response uh, readiness, Nigeria scored uh, below limited capacity. Now, so if you put all this in, into perspective that Nigeria is not wearing masks, or the, most of the population, I'm not saying everybody in Nigeria, but many of the population in Nigeria are not wearing masks, not maintaining social distancing in many areas and then you overlay it with Nigerian preparedness for public health. Now, this number, seven, over 70,000 cases, is something that is very, very, uh, kind of like an uh, interesting number. Now, I'm not gonna say that this number is 100% accurate. Even when you look at US numbers, nobody will say US number is 100% accurate. Right? Nobody will say that the global case is 100%. But what we look at, how much of is this number for Nigerian cases? Is that too, may, too much away from uh, being accurate? Now, if it's not, then the phenomenon is very interesting when Nigeria has these issues internally. And yet, their cases are, is very low. The, the uh, uh, what is it called? The recovery rate is higher than uh, the United States and many countries around the world. So this is very important phenomenon. Now the question is that I'm asking through all my processes: one, is there a, a type of uh, environmental factor that uh, uh, remember the route of transmission for this virus? According to CDC, nobody knew actually uh, how this virus is being transmitted. It was a lot of research here and there, trial and error, and then we come now with the hypothesis about how the virus is transmitted through airborne. Now, if it's through airborne, then the question is, is, is there a possibility that that environmental factor. I give example, temperature and humidity, you know, and moist, that when this virus is out there already, the type of humidity we have in Nigeria or temperature deactivate the virus. Is it possible? Again, uh, what makes science good is when you remove politics out of science and focus really on science instead of politics in science, right? So if we look at all this possibility, we can say, okay, you know, and, uh, and design a type of study to test those hypotheses and see if that possible, right? But when you overshare the science with policies, then that's when we start getting problems and getting misinformation. So that's my own kind of like observation. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. It's, it doesn't have anything to do with temperature or humidity or countries around uh, Ecuador, right? Because that's where Nigeria is and so, uh, Ghana, Cameroon, all these countries are reporting similar low cases. Now, uh, uh, 
Uh, another thing is, uh, is there some type of chemical or drug that Nigerians are already predisposed for years? You know, uh, it's not that their gene is better than any other gene pool around the world, but because uh, they've been use, using a certain type of drug, uh, for example, just for the sake of argument, a lot of Nigeria grew up in Nigeria, you know, using chloroquine for treating, you know, malaria. Nobody knows anything about virus, but there has been here and there talks about uh, whether chloroquine actually do anything for this virus. But here's a country that, you know, are heavy users of, uh, uh, including other countries, Cameroon, Nigeria, uh, uh, Ghana, that are heavy users of this drug. Right. I'm just throwing things out there because the observation makes you to start thinking, not to start like making things political. Right. So those are the things. And based on these two things I say right now, maybe there are some type of uh, uh, things within the population uh, based on drugs they've been using or environmental factors. And maybe there's other things that are uh, we're not even thinking. Or maybe, you know, uh, the restriction Nigeria put uh, in the airport for traveling, did the a trick, you know, uh, prevented this uh, overflow of cases coming in Nigeria. Uh, but then we, uh, when I think about that, then I contradict myself. I say, okay, if that's the case, what about people that already have case in Nigeria and they're walking around, whether they're asymptomatic and being that Nigeria not adhering to uh, social distancing or masks, that will still transmit, you know, and that will still increase the number substantially. You see what I mean? So it's like um, a, a dangerous ground until you have a valid scientific evidence. But uh, a lot of scientists that are here in this, uh, this uh, uh, that called in for this discussion know that uh, a lot of science starts in good observation. And that's what I'm here to discuss, and that's what I'm here to share with the audience. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, your your you know your trip and your observation uh, was very valuable to us, um, and it makes you wonder. Um, it also shows that it doesn't hurt to um, you know come up with observe, investigate, and and that there needs to be more investigation to see because perhaps whatever is going on in Nigeria could help you know other countries, especially here in the okay. U.S where we just got word that um, the other day, our death toll was 3,000 in a day, which is crazy. Um, so, and that's just based on, um, like we always say, um, the caseloads that we receive, you know, um, there could be some numbers, could be a little bit off as far as, you know, um, when they capture that information, it could have been more deaths, you know, or, or so forth. We don't, you know, know for sure, but it's still high is, is you know, the point. Um, at this point, um, I would like to open up the floor for some d more discussion on this. If anyone have questions, um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your questions, or if you want to make any comments um, regarding this topic of discussion that we are having, um, we welcome you. Yeah. I MD, uh, hi, it's Urs. Uh, I have a couple of questions or comments. Uh, we discussed a little bit briefly already in the past about that, but uh, as you know, been comparing, uh, been comparing around the world the levels of uh, the spread of the coronavirus and also the levels of lethality of the coronavirus. And uh, in Africa, I have to say, especially the equatorial area of Africa, there is both the spread and the lethality are low. So, uh, and I was trying to make sense of that. And uh, I think perhaps around the equator, I think, uh, the again, the humidity of the air is higher. Uh, so the aerosol doesn't go as fast. You know, droplets go down on the, on the ground maybe, maybe faster. So there is the, the physics of the, the spread that is altered. And um, then also the lethality might perhaps be explained by the fact that uh, people uh, are younger on average, 
in those countries. And therefore, um, you know, they, they don't die. They maybe get a little bit sick, but they don't die of it, like uh, it is the case in Europe. And so I, I compare a little bit South Africa and Italy, two countries that climatically speaking are closer. They have about the same level of population. I think South Africa is 59 some million, Italy is 60 point some million, so about the same. And uh, the spread is by far, by far much lower in South Africa. It's maybe a third. And South Africa has a good number of uh, people with uh, COVID, but uh, much lower. And the lethality, I don't even compare. You know, Italy is, uh, I, I don't know, it's up in, in right now in one per thousand Italian are dying of COVID lately. And uh, in South Africa, it's uh, probably less than a third of that. So I uh, was wondering, you know, if you, if you had to, to go through all the variables, you know, well, well first of all, you know, I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm not an MD, but I'm just asking questions. You know, all the variables that you can look at that can explain how the virus spread, and then uh, what causes the lethality, more or less? What, what would you say to look at? Uh, by the way, this is the uh, uh, Dr. Paciotti. Uh, Dr. Paciotti is one of the pioneers of biotech uh, technology in the world uh, here in Davis, uh, California. So, uh, Dr. Facciotti, it's a pleasure having you here. Uh, he's as, also uh, my mentor. Uh, thank you, Dean, here. Your question is very, very Im important. And uh, the reason it's important is that when you uh, look at uh, uh, stuff like this that you don't have answers to, uh, you can start fishing and you fish too much and you spread your net very, very wide and you will be... <laughs> you will not have the answers you're looking for. So if I were to do this, or if anybody needs to do this, I would say to start with things that, you know, that you just mentioned, for example, now, you know, looking at humidity, looking at some type of common uh, drugs most of the population in these African countries are using, right? We could have even perhaps already have the drug for this. And we didn't know, you know, and it's somewhere there in Africa because there's so many NGOs, so many things that's happening in Nigeria. And, of course, uh, let's do more study on this chloroquine because I know that to be a common denominator in most of these African countries that they're using that. Is there any atom of truth in that? It, 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 does it play a role? Because, again, what uh, produces some type of uh, uh, preventative measure, it's not usually one thing. It could be multifactorial. It could be many things, right? So I will look into uh, temperature. I will look into uh, population-based factors such as uh, any type of uh, drug, you know, the population is uh, used to that are common. And I will lo look at the, the age of the population and, uh, you know, do some kind of basic uh, epidemiologic study to understand what is going on. Again, whatever you found might not be causal, because for you to even make uh, a conclusion about causal, you have to do experimental design study. Uh, what you can only do in this case, ethical thing you can do in this case, will be observational uh, cohort study and uh, see what happened, and then you can come up with some information then it can lead to uh, other experimental uh, design type study. I don't know if I answered your question, Dr. Fachi. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think you did indeed, but uh, yeah, let me just ask a, a quick question. I don't want to, to take over, but uh, the, for example, antibodies, viral antibodies in Nigeria, at least do they test for it? to see if uh, a large portion of the population is naturally immunized? So that, that's a great question. Remember, I was in Nigeria for 
a little bit over a month. Okay, so I just had a basic observation in Nigeria. I didn't go into detail in terms of looking into the type of molecular level analysis. I did not have that time to do that. Um, but I think there's, I think there's several people that called in into this discussion uh, in uh, from Nigeria, a lot of scientists and university professors. So they can answer that question. But uh, I think, again, this discussion is bringing up things to look into, you know, uh, and test for. Like I said, Nigeria has a lot of scientists, able scientists that should be looking into this. Nigeria, uh, in fact, should not be waiting for Europe or the uh, United States to do this. Nigeria should have the capacity to uh, use their scientists to provide information on what is going on in their country. And, and that's, I'm very, very passionate about this because African countries as, as a whole should be doing that. African countries should not be waiting for Europe or the United States to do a basic study in their country to, you know, share information they learn in their country with the world. Okay, thanks, Cindy. Thank you, Dr. Francis. Uh, Very good doctor, question and conversation. Doctor, may I say something? This is Raman Dr. Raman go ahead. Okay. Based on some of the, uh, there's a recent, uh, just one second. There's a recent finding uh, from Kenya, uh, an immunologist by name uh, Yuga. They tested about 3,000 blood uh, donors and then uh, there was this estimate of their preprint last month that about 20 Kenyans aged 15 to 64, or 1.6 million people have antibodies to Syria COVID vi uh, virus 2, an indication of past infection. And this is possibly one of the the revolution of the puzzle, if we can go back into the continent and take a blood sample of a very great population, sampling it from both the East Coast to Central African Republic and then also West Africa, this probably will un unveil the mystery of what we're discussing. But the problem is lack of funding, and uh, the governments are not paying attention to that. But based on this, prior to this time also, I saw it in I think Bill Gates' website, this was two months ago, indicating that uh, it is likely that Africans have been predisposed to a similar virus and they have the immu immunity to this virus. And Dr. Dr. Manambo, this is very, very <laughs> important uh, information you just shared. And thank you, Dr. Patriotti, for asking the question. Again, this is the essential role of what Papa Halik is doing, having a healthy discussion on this. And then, you know, for the government of Nigeria and the rest of African countries to start paying attention to science and doing their own study and coming up because all this stuff we are talking about vaccine, you know, uh, they are so, I mean, let's assume this is, you know, a factual information and it's already verified by a lot of scientists across Africa. That's you know, uh, the cure right there for, uh, for this uh, 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 virus, right? Uh, it's readily available. So we need to be participants instead of just sitting on the sideline and watching, you know. Thank you. And Dr. Fatiotti, I think you want to say something. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, funding. The World Health Organization cannot help, for example, if there are initiatives in Africa that, uh, you know, would test and confirm, for example, the presence of antibodies, which I think it's, it's well, it could explain, it could explain a lot of, uh, of what is happening in Africa. Couldn't they help doing that? Is that a question for me or a question for yeah, uh, for, for whomever has an idea or has contacts with the, the World Health Organization? Well, again, this is where it, I it, also it try to talk about how science uh, uh, you know, involve politics, right? So remember all these agencies you, you mentioned, you know, if that is in their agenda to do, if that's what they want to do, the funding, you're right, the funding will be, will, will be there for that study to be done. Now, 
If the focus is on a different direction to focus on vaccine or any other thing outside of this uh, uh, continent that we are seeing that the cases are very low, then it doesn't matter. Either the government of those co uh, African continent has to be the one uh, pioneering and sponsoring those first initial uh, uh, studies, uh, then that's what it has to uh, be. But right now, uh, I don't know the 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 role of World Health Organization in terms of looking into that that specific antibody study. Um, we have some comments in the chat. Do you want to address those, please? Can you read that, please? Stop yeah, ahead. I'm having. Uh, I'm trying to. I'm trying to get the chat back up. My computer. So um, Miss Watts says that she thinks that Nigeria should keep quiet um, before the U.S. Uh, send psych ops over to start infecting the population because uh, I guess she feels that the U.S. cannot be trusted. And um, then, um, so that was a comment. Um, the another comment was um, from Grievous uh, says that it's amazing that the recovery rate in Nigeria is so high because the country's medical resources. And um, then um, Enwaka says, thanks everyone for the opportunity to, to discuss um, my concern is about the statistics reported for Nigeria, particularly the 94% recovery rate. Uh, Nigeria as a whole has very poor medical surveillance, and the COVID cases may not be accurate. Accurate, excuse me. Secondly, it appears that most COVID patients treated in the COVID-designated facilities presented with mild symptoms because no report of ICU admission or use of ventilators. And that kind of goes with what um, you know Grievous was um, getting at, I believe. Um, any uh, comment or opinion on that? But, you know, my thoughts were going the same way um, mentioned as far as the numbers uh, were concerned. Um, I was thinking, you know, that there was uh, something missing there, you know, when, the, when they've done their, um, posted their statistics. Now, I totally agree with the numbers, and, and uh, I have my doubts about the numbers, but when you usually don't have alternative uh, fact check, then all you have is that number, right? So um, I don't think Nigeria, as you can see in this slide, doesn't have good surveillance for that. But uh, that being said, I use myself as an experiment because when I was in Nigeria, let's assume like the number is wrong and everything and all other stuff. People around me, I'm telling you, the crowd around me every day when I go out and people around me could have been exposed to this virus. And guess what? I could have got infected, right? So yes, the number might not be uh, 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 accurate, but, you know, when you put yourself in that environment and just you know, at some point, actually, when I was in Nigeria and observing, I'm very, very scared and wearing masks all the time. I lost it in the sense that I become, I started normalizing the behavior of not wearing masks. At some point, I will go out. I'm not even, my mask is in the bag, but I'm not even wearing masks. I'm going like, because now I'm adapting and adopting that behavior, right? So I actually exposed myself a lot, but yes, I, I wasn't sick. A lot of people around me, crowd, family members, weren't sick. So that's where I'm coming from. Like there's something else going on in in Nigeria. It could be anti antibody uh, thing, environment. So it could be, you know, the exposed drug previously, like Dr. Eminem just shared. We cannot just dismiss that because that's something that could be a fact, a factual statement. Right, and uh, Dr. Charity um, typed that, um, I think the situation in Nigeria may be as a result that Nigerians suffer from malaria, which has similar signs and symptoms with COVID-19 and thus have developed some resistance to COVID-19. So that's interesting that that statement was said because when you were in Nigeria, we were talking about it, we did pose that that could be a possibility as well, based on your observation and um, your notation of your experience, um, we did conclude the same thing. So it seems like um, the thought process of everyone, um, we're all 
hitting upon the same, you know, the same, we're on the same path here as far as um, our speculations and, and so forth. But um, the bottom line is, you know, um, it's just going to take some people, more research out to, you know, be presented out there. I assume that, it, you know, we'll probably um, have some um, substantiated research in the future as regards to um, what has happened and transpired in Nigeria. Um, but we just encourage everyone to continue to, um, you know, read uh, and come to your own conclusions and, and make your own decisions based on um, good information. Are there we any have other a question. questions? Yes, oh, I, have, I have, a I have question. something to add on. Um, like uh, somebody was doubting about the, um, about the population, infected population. Yes, uh, that could be true that all the cases are not accurately reported. Uh, but um, I will not, I will believe the recovery rate because from experience, like it's already was presented, um, how people are walking around without wearing masks, no social distancing, all those things. And people, like when I was there, I was waiting for people to, like after maybe like seven days to start getting yeah. sick and being admitted in the ICU, but I, I didn't see that because of lack of social distancing, lack of not wearing masks, and but nothing like that. Nobody, everybody was after seven days, fourteen days, everybody was fine and going about their business, not even having a headache, no symptom, nothing like that. So it has to, we have to look into more of about the you know, environment in Nigeria and more about the antibody building, like uh, another doctor already mentioned about, you know, looking to that cases because the recovery rate is, is accurate because um, I, I, you know, I, I experienced that myself, like no, absolutely no social distancing. 90% of the population not wearing masks, but they go around their business, they don't get sick, they don't even have any kind of my symptom about about this. So so it's some it's very interesting. Thank you, Peace Okoyo, for uh sharing uh, your experience as well. Those are the type of things we need. We need people that can share their experience as an observatory experience and then we need uh scientists across Nigeria across uh, and uh, to be honest we need Nigerian government support. You know, Nigerian government need to step up. African government need to step up. You know, uh, and it, it pains me a lot whenever a global pandemic happens. It's like Africa is looking around and waiting for everybody else to save them. You know, it's really, really a painful situation. It, it, I think it's about time that uh, all these uh, countries in the African continent need to understand that they need to also uh, play as the big man in the room uh, and step up or big women in the room or whatever it is, you know, not to be a sexist, you know, but, um, you know, and step up and do the work they should be doing. I have a question, Dr. Melo. Uh, this is Florence Njang. Thank you, Florence. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, my question is now, with the low levels of prevention uh, to COVID-19, and um, the vaccine coming out. How do we um, convince the public to accept the vaccine as a means of preventing COVID-19? If by all means they have been going about their businesses with, with very minimal prevention, just a handful of people wearing their uh, masks and social distancing, and yet they didn't contract COVID-19. How do we now tell them that, oh, the vaccine is here, it's gonna help you prevent COVID-19? Great question. Uh, those are, you know, I have so many videos and I, I did not have time uh, based on one hour a slot we have for this to share those videos. Those are one of the questions I ask uh, people I meet on the street. You see, anybody that, have, uh, that is from Africa or Nigeria will see a lot of people on the street selling things, you know, and all that stuff. So I ask them this question. Majority of people I ask, is not even interested in the vaccine. They do not care about the vaccine. They don't have anything to do with the vaccine. They keep saying there's no coronavirus in, in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. 
you know, there's no coronavirus in their state. They, so vaccine is like, <laughs> it will be a joke because nobody in Nigeria will pay attention to that vaccine. You know, uh, Nigerian government can get the vaccine just as a political measure, but I'm telling you right now, nobody's going to uh, agree to, uh, may, well, maybe some people, but majority of the people will not agree to take the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that, thank you, thank Florence, you for that. Um, You're welcome. But, yes, thank you, Florence. And that goes okay. with, um, we'll take the two more questions because we could talk about this all day. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because um, this is a very interesting topic. topic um, and there were two questions in the, two state comments in the um, the chat. But um looks like George kind of um, goes with Florence when she was talking about the vaccine. So um, he said, diverting, is CDC going to provide COVID-19 vaccine adverse incidents in the United States once the vaccine is administered to the U.S. population? I don't know that. Great, great question. You know, uh, uh, in fact, I'm not going to mention them, but one of my clients actually reviewed uh, the uh, a vaccine that was sent to him uh, to FDA to verify uh, the adverse event and uh, also verify the cases uh, that they use for that vaccine. And when we were, I was talking to him about this, we were having discussion. By the way, I, I have my master's in clinical research, so I know something about uh, a lot about uh, clinical trials. I already know that the time that they, they spent to do this clinical trial and came out with the vaccine is insufficient. It's not mm -hmm. even close. It will take about six to nine years to get, uh, from, you know, starting from the scratch when you have a, a condition that you don't know anything about to get a, a, a drug, a new drug, to make sure that that drug has good efficacy and safety. That's how long it takes. That's the process, right? And we've seen this with HIV too, how they rushed it. Within a few months, they got HIV, AZT, which wasn't effective, right? So um, I don't know. It's just uh, uh, weird because um, the, the key thing I asked about vaccine, do they have a, a, enough time to uh, verify and authenticate and validate safety and efficacy? And the answers to a lot of experts I asked, even though I know the answer to this, is no, they don't. Now, uh, we are in a climate that surrounds us with a lot of politics. Now, the question will be, would they share the information transparently, right? I don't know that. I'm not in the government. Uh, I'm a scientist. I don't know what uh, the government will do, whether they will share the information transparently and openly to everybody. And um, I don't know. So I don't know about the audience, their opinion on, on this one, but it, it, this one is very, very tricky uh, thing because now there's some comments you're gonna make on the vaccine. People is gonna see you as anti-vaccine. That's not the case. What we're having here is a scientific discussion, right? It's not about being anti-vaccine. It's about looking at things as a, uh, using scientific protocol. Uh, and that's the key thing, but it is uh, what it is right now. And hopefully we will know more as we progress and get more information about the vaccine. I think Hello. if somebody is saying something, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Th thank you, Dr. Melu. I'm so happy to participate in this incredible seminar. With your experience in drugs and your incredible experience in research, you have been able to demystify that the, the time frame they use in producing this COVID-19 vaccine is inappropriate. With what you have said now, simply means that Nigerian government, with escalating rate of this coronavirus, it will not be ideal to subscribe to the vaccine, which has been announced in U.S. Recently. Well, uh, uh, thank you for the question. I don't know if you're done with your question. Because, yeah. Uh, okay. So, yeah, the Nigerian government still have to make their own decision. 
you know, uh, and consult. Nigerian government has Ministry of Health, right? They need to consult their scientists. They need to get up together and also look at the document, look at the adverse events reported for this short time period. But any scientists, any clinical research scientists around the world will tell you how long it to get a new drug out. And the time period we, we, they spend to get this drug out is not uh, it, it's not normal. It's something abnormal. Of course, it's something like we we'll say, well, we're in an emergency situation, so we put all our resources together. But also, when you do that, you also have to pay attention that you miss things that you will not usually miss in, num in normal circumstances. And that is a key thing because we're talking about population health. We're talking about millions of people. You know, if anything on, in this vaccine goes wrong, we're talking about millions of people that will be infected, uh, affected by this. So yeah, that's very, very important. Thank you. Are you welcome. Uh, my, Dr. Emil, I may say something. This is Amanamba. Uh, Dr. Amanamba, go ahead. Usually, I, I run into a lot of people that have some drawbacks in terms of accepting the new version, but I usually give them some insight in terms of something like uh, smallpox. Smallpox has been eradicated globally. Uh, there was a time that smallpox was a very serious pandemic, especially in Africa. Uh, in spite of uh, the adverse effects, personally, I, I would like most of the aging population to get the vaccine because as you age, there is a tendency that your immune system drops comparable to younger uh, uh, children and then, uh, maybe teenagers. And I don't know, based on your position, is is United States government going to make it an immunization policy on this COVID uh, vaccine? You know, I don't watch news a lot, but I, I'm already started hearing that rumor that even the airline is, is trying to, again, this is rumor. Let me pronounce it again, rumor. I'm not saying that I have definitive evidence on this, that it, it might get to the point that you might, you know, they might not let you fly until you have the vaccine. So uh, I don't know. That's, uh, that's some type of uh, rumor I heard uh, through the media. A news station. So I don't know what the policy will be. Uh, again, I will leave it up to politicians. I will leave it up to the government to make decisions in their separate countries, uh, continents. Uh, but uh, I'm just sharing observation. I'm just uh, 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 focusing on more what we call scientific procedures that we use for uh, getting drug out and getting drug approval. I'm saying the timeline timeline is too short to uh, validate uh, safety and efficacy. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome, Dr. Eminem. I hand it over to you, Dr. Haley. All right. Um, I don't want to, um, I know uh, Enwaka has made some statements. Um, I don't want to look like I'm ignoring, so we'll close out with um, the statements that have been made because there were two uh, that we missed. Um, so regarding the vaccines, the backbone for this COVID-19 vaccine, I understand has already been studied and developed over years. So it may not be right to say that it was rushed. And then, uh, let me scroll up. The other comment that was said was, um, so there is a the reason to query the recovery rate is uh, related to the question where those people actually infected with COVID. Again, the politics play a role in the number of cases reported. There is a need to scientifically determine what goes on around COVID in Nigeria. So we'll close out with those. Um, do you want to, would you like to make a comment regarding uh, those comments? Uh, agree, disagree? No, 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 no. I mean, that's uh, anybody that participated here share their own opinion and uh, yeah, of in course. Our situation. No, I don't think none of us sitting here has done any pure scientific research on these and present their papers. You know, just uh, observation, opinion. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 okay. Dr. Miller, this is Frank. Oh, okay, Frank. Yeah. Um, my um, 
my personal experience uh, on this issue is that, um, yeah, let me, hold on. Yeah, I just um, uh, took a walk and came back. I'm not sure if you guys have seen me. Yeah, I'm seeing Are you, you, doctor. I, I've got it. I'm seeing you. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, um, my personal experience, I, I mean, thank you again before I start for uh, you guys putting this thing together. Um, it's very informative and um, hopefully we'll use that avenue to do more um, um, in, um, in bringing our people closer together. But um, I think we need to find out, um, um, you know, is it because immunity? Is it because uh, people are not being tested enough? Um, what is it? Uh, in our, our small chat, um, you know, the if you look at the whatever the uh, percentage or whatever the number they're giving up to us is low, um, that's something that actually is not making it to be as as uh, business it is. You know, um, I belong to a, a platform or a group that uh, I've been fighting with them. They say, oh, Frank, get out here. We don't have COVID. You guys, by the way, they've been sympathizing with us. So how can we... Um, um, how can we uh, make it in a way that um, uh, people will, um, um, you know, understand that uh, this is real? How can we tell her the message? Just like us here, how can we also tell her the message so that the uh, Black American, uh, African American can participate in the um, uh, vaccine that is being out? You know, so those are the things that I, I, I don't know how the message will go because they, they don't want to hear it. I mean, this is Christmas season that we all know. Um, I believe that this uh, forum is uh, Africa, um, um, Africa. Um, you know, I believe this forum, forum is for not only for Nigeria, but it's for Nigeria is better. How can we tell us this message in Nigeria? People will listen and hear because this Christmas season, there are so much activities going on that is involved with large crowd. So how would the message be? What can we do? Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, I, got I heard you. So uh, I, I think uh, the, the most important thing is just to understand that uh, uh, this forum is to share observation that I, I noticed on my trip to Nigeria and also uh, I was in Nigeria, I was in crowd, many crowd, many markets and all that stuff. He just shared an observation. Now it's left for Nigerian government to figure out what is going on in Nigeria and the rest of other African continent. In terms of uh, people uh, uh, understanding COVID-19, yes, uh, people in Nigeria, they're not really ignorant about that. They know what COVID is. They know the virus is real. Uh, my conversation with many people, they believe COVID virus is real. Somehow, they do not believe that COVID is spreading in Nigeria. Now, there's what we call herd immunity. And you've had so many people say that, you know, there's been antibody and they've seen so many population. That's the same thing a vaccine would do. Vaccine would create a herd immunity, meaning that once many people, everybody, in a country doesn't have to be vaccinated. A high number of people that get vaccination creates hard immunity for other people that do not receive the vaccine. So if in this African country, this phenomenon is true, right? That the, uh, the anti, uh, there's many population in Nigeria that already developed antibody for this uh, particular virus, then that's mimicking exactly what the vaccine will do. But I hear you about tolerant message. We will always have this kind of discussion and then share it, put it in public.org, share it in YouTube for people to understand more often that virus is real. And they did understand that when I spoke to them in Nigeria. Uh, thank you for the question. Thank you all. I'm going to close out because you three requested made sure that I said, said their comment before we close out, but we do have to end this discussion. Uh, what was said is of the 70,000 in Nigeria who acquired COVID-19, is there any record of those who have previously taken uh, chloroquine also, oh, and also given Dr. Facioti's 
report comparing similar climates of South Africa to Italy tends to eliminate climate factors. And that was, um, that's in closing uh, the comment. And, and I will say, um, you know, we, we're, uh, we did talk about the idea of uh, um, the malaria vaccination and so forth. Um, and, you know, again, yes, that could be a post possibility uh, to this as well as um, everything else. Um, in closing, I'm going to close out and I would like to thank everybody for attending uh, this discussion. Everybody that contributed, uh, listened in, um, you guys gave some invaluable information. Um, we thank you so much for supporting us on our first live discussion. Um, you know, we were a little nervous about this, but it, it was successful. Um, this is what Pulpolic is all about, um, filtering uh, healthy discussions, healthy people, and encouraging everybody to go out and, and um, adhere to social change so that you can have healthy environments. We thank you again, and um, have a great weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup.